We set our mind on the things of the flesh. How you know you have your mind set on the things of the flesh? Everything that you know about God only comes from natural senses. That means you process God through your logic instead of processing your logic through God. So therefore, you reduce him down to your level of understanding instead of being awakened to the mind of Christ that abides within. It goes on to say this. For the mindset on the, on the flesh is hostile toward God. It creates hostility toward God. Most, listen, if there's hostility in your relationship with God, it's not God, it's your belief system. It is your belief system that's creating hostility between him because your belief system says he has left you when the Bible says he will never leave you nor forsake you. The, the Bible creates enmity, but, but the, I mean, the belief system creates enmity between you and God and tells you That's why there's such an internal battle going on. It's not a battle of, of, of two natures. It's a battle of an unrenewed mind. I'm not warring against an old sin nature. I'm warring against old patterns of thinking that's still connected to a nature I no longer have. Well, will you tell me I, I need personal responsibility? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. You need to take ownership of your life. You need to take ownership of your mind. Listen, you're already thinking anyways. You might as well think like Jesus. That's the way I look at it, man. I, I'm, I'm living in this world anyways. I might as well live like Jesus. I'm already thinking anyways. I might as well think like Jesus. I'm already having emotions anyway. I might as well have the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Man, when you look at it that way, it's like, duh. Man, all, my emotional state of being is all nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness. Self-control. And some of us, I need to do a whole conference on self-control. I wonder how many people would show up. Man, any, listen, any emotion that you have that contradicts the fruit of the Spirit is a lie seeking the authority of truth. You see, the main way that Satan displaces truth in your life is by getting you to the, to the facts of your life instead of the truth of the gospel. He'll say, did God really say that by his wounds you are healed when you have a sickness? He'll say, he'll say, did God really say that he'll supply to you according to his riches and glory when you're in poverty? But why? He's trying to connect your life, your mindset to the facts of this world instead of the truth of God's world. You should never allow the facts of your life to prophesy to your promise, but you should allow the promise of God's word to prophesy to the facts of your life. I came out of atheism. I came out of the deepest level of unbelief that you could possibly be in. And when I got saved, the fun number one gift I function in now is faith. God has sent me to the church to, to infuse back into the church faith so that now they can actually think like God, have faith of God, not just faith in God. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And listen to this. And we are taking some thoughts captive. Isn't that an interesting statement? It says we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of who? Christ. Do you, do you realize how significant every thought that you have in your mind is? The dominant thought that you have in your mind right now is literally the prophetic voice of tomorrow's destiny. All right, let me try this side. 
The predominant thought that you have in your mind right now is the profit of your life. What are you thinking? What you are thinking is either quenching the flow of the Spirit or releasing the flow of the Spirit. What you're thinking is either, either creating hostility between you and the government of the Spirit or coming into alignment with the government of the Spirit. Based on this passage right here, it shows you that demonic strongholds are developed through patterns of thought that's inconsistent with the Word of God or the mind of Christ. Man, when I first got saved, I began to get in the Word of God and allow the Word of God to teach me and allow the Word of God to transform me. And you know what I realized? That 95% of my sin issues fell off. Not be, listen, not because I had to locate every lie I ever believed about my life. No, it's because I embraced truth. And when I embraced truth, by default, the lies were broken off. Consider this, John chapter 8 verse 32 says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall. See, you already know it. So by that context, the truth I don't know is what's keeping me bound. So all bondage is a byproduct of a lie believed in the lifeline of a lie is the absence of truth. All right. The greatest enemy to your life is not the devil, it is your own ignorance. Consider this, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, my people perish for lack of... See, you already know it. A lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, so, under, so, so a lack of understanding or ignorance is the place, is the seedbed that deception grows in. It's, it gives, it's the lifeline to Satan's lies and to deceit. But if the only thing I fill my mind with is God's word, God's truth, then therefore I become a weapon of warfare identifying every lie the devil speaks. And so when he opens his mouth, he immediately gets shut up. Man, the devil don't talk to me no more. Every time he talks to me, he gets beat up. Poor Mr. Devil. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will. See, you already know it. But the level of my resistance is contingent upon the level of my submission, and the level of my submission is contingent upon the renewal of my mind according to God's word. All right. So, so, so let me ask you, why is the devil running to you and not from you? He may be running to you because you don't have a weapon of warfare of truth to expose a lie when it comes. So therefore, you create a landing strip for his voice to come in. You, you can't actually wake up in the morning, the devil's standing there looking at you. You can be like Smith and Wigglesworth and say, oh, it's just the devil and go back to sleep. That is not some fairy tale. That is not some book of Narnia. This is, this is not sci-fi. This is the real word of God. This is the reality that I walk in. If, it, if I'm not really, if this is a dream, please, you just let me sleep the rest of my life because this is how I'm living. I realize Satan is victim to my victory. I realize that the weapon of my warfare, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, says the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, the word of truth. So therefore, it is the weapon that I have to destroy the warfare of the enemy coming against me. So if I don't have truth and I'm going into a sword fight without a weapon. And so therefore, I become a master at avoiding the devil instead of confronting him. Was I rapping just then? I had to keep up with that flow of thought. Do you realize that we become experts at avoiding the devil because we don't have the weapon of our warfare to actually confront him? So therefore, when he shows up, we run. Or we become so, so good at, at dodging his schemes and dodging his ways. We're, we're escape artists and we're, we're great at escaping his schemes, but yet we don't have a weapon of warfare to stop those schemes so somebody else doesn't fall into them. You're not called to escape the schemes of the enemy. You're called to destroy the works of the devil. First John chapter 3, verse 8. <laughs> I 
Man, you have more victory than what you realize you have. You have more freedom than what you realize you have. That freedom is not a, not a process of attainment, but a process of yielding submission to God within, the Spirit within. This is why Proverbs says, as a man thinks in himself, so he As you think in yourself, so you are. You have God's spirit living inside of you. He loves you so much, he's willing to live inside of you as a captive until you learn obedience. Oh, man. <laughs> Hear me? The God of the universe has chosen to live inside of you and not to control you, but learn for your will to come under submission to him until his will can be demonstrated through your life. He loves you so much that he's willing to live inside of you as a captive. I wouldn't live inside of you. What do you mean? God's control. He controls everything. He's, he's sovereign. Well, he's sovereign, but he's not sovereign in the sense that he controls every little thing, bitty thing because if he was in control of your life, you wouldn't have cussed out your neighbor. If he was in control of your life, you wouldn't have got mad at that person that gave you that one finger wave. <laughs> I could tell some of you are really thinking about what I'm saying here. Our aim here at Global Awakening is creating and producing powerful people that know that they can go in inside any environment and be untouched by that environment in the sense that it doesn't change or transform them or conform them. I'm here to tell you that God dwells inside of you. I'm here to tell you that you're righteous and holy and pure. I'm here to tell you that, that God dwells there, that you have to just learn to yield to him, renew your mind according to God's word. And now the government of the spirit begins to take place and the flow of the spirit begins to take place. And now your thinking begins to change. Your, your talking begins to change. Your actions begin to change. Spirit of the Lord is in here. I'm not addressing the church, I'm just praying in the Spirit. That's all I'm doing. See, there's just too many of us, we believe the lies of the devil for so long that when we hear truth like this, it, it seems that that truth is lie. Because we've been so conditioned by the world and what the media says and what the world around us says that, that when we hear the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, if it sounds like a sci-fi or some fairy tale, I'm here to tell you it's a reality from God. It's a reality from above. And it's a reality that you can walk in, that you can talk in, that you can experience on a daily basis. It's not, oh man. I had this pastor one time, he would always say to me, he says, William, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And I finally got tired of it and I rebuked him. I said, well, you're so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. Then I quoted Colossians chapter three, one and two. It says, set your mind on the things above. The point is you're to be so heavenly minded that you're earthly good. And some of us are not earthly good because we're earthly minded. We set our mind on the things of the flesh. How you know you have your mind set on the things of the flesh? Everything that you know about God only comes from natural senses. That means you process God through your logic instead of processing your logic through God. So therefore, you reduce him down to your level of understanding instead of being awakened to the mind of Christ that abides within.
Do you know, do you realize that the mind of Christ is you being, I mean, the renewing of the mind is you being awakened to the mind of Christ you already have. You're not becoming more like Jesus. You're becoming aware that you're already like him. I've been walking in this stuff for way too long, and I don't care who the person is. You're not going to talk me out of the Word of God. You're not going to talk me out of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what kind of influence you have. I don't care what kind of platform you have. If it doesn't align to what God's Word says about me, I don't listen to it. And so many of us, we've given more value to man's opinion than the voice of God. And so therefore, we get all messed up with all these opinions instead of truth. First John chapter 3 verse 20. Can you tell I like the Bible? First John chapter 3 verse 20 and 21. It basically says this. That if your conscience doesn't condemn you, you have confidence before God. If you feel judged and condemned, it's not God. It's either two things. Your conscience, improper thinking, unbelief, false beliefs, or Satan. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, therefore, anyone that is in Christ, there is no condemnation. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, you've been justified by faith, so therefore you have peace with God. So therefore, he's not angry at you, so why not live like you're at peace with God? Man, I'm at peace with God. I'm not trying to, to perform for his attention. He thinks I'm to die for. Did you guys command the time to stop? I don't think you did. Oh, man. I need every single one of you to send an email to Randy Clark. I'm kidding. I want to connect 1 Corinthians 6, 17 to another passage of Scripture. Even though you're filled with His Spirit, even though He already abides within you, as I said, Scripture is written in paradox. Even though you already have the existence of God living inside of you, you can continue to live in an ongoing infilling of His Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with with the Spirit. Isn't that an interesting contrast? Don't be drunk with wine, this is a side note, but be filled with the Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, what, what were bystanders saying to those that were filled with the Spirit? They must be drunk with wine. Man, but yet we see someone drunk in alcohol, we think that's normal, but we see someone drunk in the Spirit, somehow that's weird. That's of the devil. One, one kills you, the other one produces life, so therefore, we need to learn to renew our mind according to truth so I can go, go on to continue infilling of the Holy Spirit.